this roundtable is uh, in, in partnership with Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And of course, our, our, our title for this is, what is the potential for circular design within fashion and textiles? Um, uh, we, uh, the, the description for it is talking about the potential shift towards a circular economy, economy fueled by passionate disruptors on the constant search for reinvention. How good is that? Honestly, if that doesn't get your heart beating, I don't know what will. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to look at those, those questions. How can we eliminate waste and pollution in the fashion industry? How can we circulate products and materials? And also, how can we make sure fashion is of a regenerative nature? Anyway, a little bit about me before we start. I'm, I'm dead chuffed to be here. I've come over the Pennines from Leeds this morning. We'll forgive you. Oh my goodness. Yorkshire pride is at stake here. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I'm an incomer come over over the Pennine, Pennines to do this. I think I'm here because uh, I'm a presenter and a journalist um, and uh, I've done a lot of work around sustainable fashion and around zero waste fashion um, and around circular economy and donor economics and things like that. So I, I, I've worked quite a lot in this area. I mean, I used to be a politician myself, actually. And back in the 90s, um, I remember trying to talk about the issues in the whole concept of a circular economy as a politician, and it was really tough, I'll be honest. I mean, frankly, I've sat on the question time panel in the past trying to talk about these issues, right? It, it was almost impossible in the early 90s. I mean, it's still pretty difficult now. But uh, for me, it does fill us with a lot of um, hope that we're having these discussions more widely now, that the, the concept that, uh, as I say, I was talking about then, people thought I was absolutely insane. And it's so good that, that now we are talking about these things much more widely. I actually trained to be a fashion designer myself many, many years ago. Um, <clears throat> never went into it. I got diverted by politics. That's what happens for you. Um, but uh, I, 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 I mention this because during that first discussion, I was, think, I was thinking about this so much. So um, I actually was so lucky to grow up in a family where we kind of all grew up on the principles of the arts and craft movement. And I was thinking a lot about that through a lot of that discussion in the, in the first panel. Um, the, one of those things that is, was, was pushed into me from such an early age was something cannot be beautiful and aesthetic if the process of making it was bad and that the process is as important as where you get. You cannot a chair cannot be beautiful if it's uncomfortable. I know we talked about that a bit earlier, didn't we? But also a, a dress, an outfit cannot be beautiful if the getting there hurt loads and loads of people. And you know, that's such a simple kind of theory, isn't it? But I think it is something that we've forgotten. Um, my grandfather was a stained glass artist. Um, he actually had his stained glass studio uh, in a place called Piggott's Hill on the edge of London, which was where there was quite a well-known community of artists who were working on around the arts and craft principle are quite a lot of very famous artists. Uh, if you go on YouTube, there's actually um, a, a lovely BBC programme called In The Making. Um, it's 20 minutes of him making a stained glass window and that's literally all it is. So if you like a bit of slow television and you want to see how stained glass is made, uh, do go in and, and Google In The Making, um, Joseph Nutchins. Um, but when it was all scrubbed, because my dad grew up in that, and then he went on to become, as well as an artist, a, a, an educationalist, and he, he was one of the founders of the Polytechnic System. And uh, he made a TV programme in the 70s, which is probably my first TV appearance, because I'm crawling in it. I'm literally that, I'm like a, li I'm a little baby that crawls across. We get, oh, this is so, we get taken on a painting trip on a Saturday afternoon, right? That is how normal my upbringing was, that Saturday afternoon family excursions were a painting trip, and I'm crawling across. But anyway, in there, they have a discussion about the nature of education and design. This is 1972 right? And they're all discussing the role of design. And, uh, and I know that, that, that that's what dad taught when he was setting up Leeds Polytechnic. So for me, it's brilliant to hear these conversations are still going on because I had plenty of them when I was younger. Let's bring it back to the fashion industry and today. Uh, 15 million tons of clothing go into waste every year. That's the equivalent of a truckload of garments going to landfill or incineration every second. Okay, that's the, the scale of the problem. So we've got to think about um, how can we shape 
local context? What is the potential for the wider textile ecology to drive change? Can fashion be a regenerative act? And what role can educators play? Uh, I'm, I'm pinching a line from a video we're going to watch in a second, but is it possible to build a fashion industry that's beautiful both inside and out? So let me introduce our panel that we have today to help us answer those questions. Angie Young. Hello, Angie. Hi, Angie is from Blackpool School of Arts. She's the programme leader for fashion and costume with sustainable practice. Um, and she's also a practising designer as well. She's going to show us some images of some work that she's been doing in a minute. Thank you. Uh, Christina Collins. Hi, Christina. Christina is from Blackburn University Centre. She's programme leader in fashion and textiles and a lecturer in textiles. Uh, her areas of academic and professional expertise include surface pattern design, children's wear design and illustration. Thank you for joining us. David Chadwick. Hello, David. Hello. Hello. David is from Caradice. Am I saying this right? Caradice. Nice. Paradise, there we go, Paradise and Upso. Um, they make bags in Nelson and they've been doing it since 1932. And uh, in uh, 2015, David launched Upso, producing unique bags by upcycling truck tarps, which you will see what they are, uh, which would otherwise end up in landfill. So uh, thank you for being here. We also have with us Dr. Pammy Sinha. Hi, Pammy. Uh, Pammy is Associate Professor in Fashion Management at the University of Leeds. She's a Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and the Textile Institute. She trained as a fashion designer, excuse me, and her PhD examined the fashion design process across women's wear. Uh, we also have Tom McPherson Pope. Tom, you were obviously in the first panel. Thank you for joining us here again. You're going to be talking about the Making Rooms CIC. I won't introduce you again if that's all right, because yeah. you've uh, already been yeah. introduced. Uh, let me also introduce Justine Aldersey Williams. Hi, Justine. Hi. Hello. Justine is from the Northwest Fibre Shed. It's a, she's a textile artisan and a teacher specialising in natural dyeing fabric. She founded Northwest Fibre Shed um, and she collaborates with Patrick Grant on the Home Grown Homespun project, which aims to create a bioregional fibre in the heartland of British textiles. And can I also introduce Laurie Peake? Hello, Laurie. Hi. Hi. Laurie is the founding director of uh, Super Slow Way and also co director of British Textile Biennial. She's extensive experience of public arts commissioning, cultural planning, and curating. Um, and she's uh, going to talk to us today. So thank you to uh, give it a big round of applause for our panel, please. So, okay, <laughs> to get going, uh, to kick us off, we've got a, a video from Ellen MacArthur Institute, Make Fashion Circular. When it comes to fashion, if it looks great, it should be worn. If it's by our skin, it should be safe. And when it's worn out, it shouldn't be wasted. Sounds like common sense, right? But that's not how it is today. One truckload of clothing is being burned or landfilled every second. Mountains of clothes are stuck in warehouses and at the bottom of our wardrobes. And less than 1% of used clothing is turned back into new clothes. Globally, it's costing us billions of dollars every year. This shouldn't be the price of looking and feeling good. People's demands and expectations are changing. It's time the fashion industry changes too. To thrive in the future, we need a fashion industry made up of three elements. Business models that keep clothes in use for longer, like sharing, swapping, rental, repair, and resale. Materials that are safe and renewable, so our clothes do not release microfibers that pollute our oceans, and making them does not destroy local ecosystems. Solutions, so used clothes are turned into new. Designing and making clothes so the materials can be used again and again and again. It's a new ambition for a fashion industry where clothes never become waste. There's so much that brands can do now, but no organization can shift the system alone. Make Fashion Circular brings together people across the entire industry to develop new solutions, scale the ones that work, and build a fashion industry that's beautiful, inside and out. Little introduction from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. That is a, a, a video kind of describing the challenges that there are 
in uh, making fashion circular. I mean, so, some of the things that come up in that, which I think is really interesting, which actually came up in the first uh, panel as well, is that whole question about this is moving beyond trend. This is about fundamental change to the fashion industry and about uh, not just looking at short-term solutions, but fundamentally thinking about the way people design, about the way we wear clothes, and about what happens to clothes afterwards. So I think we'll sort of move on at this point if we can. David, can I come to you? Yep. Is that all right? Tell us about your bags. Okay, well. Do you want to move your mic really close to you if that's all right? Thank you. So yeah, we're, we're based in Nelson. Um, we're a 90-year-old company. It's our 90th anniversary this year. Uh, we've basically been making uh, cycle bags and outdoor bags for, for most of that time. And about seven years ago, we launched Upso Bags. Uh, we were looking for a, a source of material that we could upcycle, and we chose lorry tarps. So these are the curtains you see on the side of, of trucks going up and down the country, up and down the motorways. And when they get to the end of their life, they usually end up in landfill. So we set about finding a, a resource for those and then stripping them down and, and using the fabric to make make bags so are we back on oh okay yeah there we go oh, we're back on we're back we on. Right. so there there is a an example of a, a lorry tarp which is in, in good condition um and uh, they get taken down usually when the uh things get rebranded or they get too damaged and and we end up with a, a rolled up piece of tarp like that and these are huge pieces of, of fabric and uh, the biggest problem we've got is actually getting them down into manageable chunks that we can actually work with so we have we need space to unroll them up unroll them all and then take off the buckles and the straps and the, the big lumpy bits and the damaged bits cut them all out and cut them down into kind of eight by four sheets then we have to wash them because they're filthy uh, so it's not an easy process uh, hands on these job and uh, it's basically a pair of scissors very sharp pair of scissors and, and knives we also use fire hose as well so again this is stuff that you'd see on your your, your fire engines uh, and again they get to the end of their life where they start leaking and losing pressure and then they're no good anymore but they are a great resource because they it's very very tough um, and it doesn't fray so you can use it like a leather substitute. So you can stamp it out. We can, we've got a clicking press, hydraulic press, and we can click them out. And th so there's us sewing um, one of our bags, just finishing off there. So we could use the same machines that we use on our canvas bags. We could use them on our upsew bags as well. So there was no, no need to change any machinery. And we got another one. Yeah, I think this one's a video. It might, might run. Um, it's, yeah. This is how fast our workers go. <laughs> she's, on, she's on piece rate, so she's really, really going to crack it out. But yeah, that's just something we did for social media, really, just to re-emphasize to uh, our customers that we, you know, we do actually make them here. We don't, we don't send them off somewhere with a low wage economy. And that's a really important part of your company, isn't it? That you, you have that local connection that local feel, that family feel is really important for you and that the people who work for you test the products, you test them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we have a very low staff, staff turnover. Um, those are the bags you can see kind of fitting into the original tarp um, and they're all unique. So when they go on the website, they're all one of one. So when you select that bag, that is the bag you get and there isn't another one the same. Um, and some, yeah, it's a bit more there finishing off with that one but yeah going back to to that yeah we we, we test everything um and uh design everything as well on site as well let me just ask you very quickly why you've done it if you've done it because to quote a phrase it's the right thing to do have you done it because it's a business opportunity have you done it it's a bit of both okay it's a bit of both i don't think i'm going to become a millionaire from doing this uh but i do get a lot of joy from doing it as well we get lots of great feedback from the customers um who really enjoy the bags uh, i mean these bags are, are lasting longer than the original purpose you know um, i think ed's ed's got a couple of bags that he bought very soon after our launch so that they, they're getting on for seven years old uh, and he's still using them um, and you know uh, they probably only last three or four years on the road 
So uh, they're lasting longer than their original thing. So yeah, it's it, it's a, it's a bit of both really. And of course, you've kitted out the factory as well, haven't you? It's yeah. Not just the yeah. recycled product. No, we, we we got a grant to put some solar panels on the roof. So the machine, so machines are driven largely by solar power during the daylight hours anyway. Not that we have a night shift, but um, and we we spilled over into other things. So that now that is kind of. Um, uh, empowered us to look at our other products so there's some of our classic kind of canvas bags and we've re replaced the leather with the fire hose um, and we only launched that kind of a few weeks ago uh, and it's got lots of great feedback from people saying oh I like your bags but I never bought them because they had leather on but now you've, you've got the fire hose straps on um, and it's a great resource that we can do that and again on, on the top of that we're getting companies coming to us saying we've got We've got this resource. Can you can you make something out of it? We, we've done lots of street banners. We've done lots of building wraps, and we, we're currently looking at a, a very interesting one where we're looking at life jackets and uh, rib boats, and looking at what we can make out of those. You're doing that with our in LA, aren't you? It, it is, yeah, yeah, uh, and that's that's great. We, we we get about eight or nine products out of one one life jacket, uh, and that's great because they've got. A ready-made market for that. They've mm. already got. They've already got products uh, on their website. I'm doing their shop. good. I'm doing good at the same time. Yeah, and yeah. And we, so they can just they can just swap them over with and have a great story to go with it. So it's kind of win-win-win. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you for that introduction. That was so good, wasn't it? Justin, can I come to you to talk to us about fibre shed and textiles and that whole question about dye and the fabrics that we're using? Okay, yeah, I um, founded Northwest England Fibre Shed in March 2020. And just to give you the background, because I think Southwest and Southeast England Fibre Sheds contributed to the report that we're discussing the circular design for fashion. Um, so we are an international organization comprising regional collectives of textiles professionals who work with local fibre and dye. And our aspiration is to work towards regeneratively grown natural fibres and dyes. So we co-create regenerative textile systems. We advocate for existing experts in the field working with, with quite a niche, um, what used to be um, everyday crafts, but are now considered quite um, rare, you know, working with natural fibers and dyes. So we kind of bridge the gap between farming and fashion and help brands and growers connect and transition towards climate beneficial practice. Now, Crucially, we think that this um, systemic change humanity needs to undertake has to come from the ground up, not the top down. That was why I was on Laurie's question in the previous session. I was like ready to dive in and just mention this, that we, we almost don't have the correct language. We haven't been raised within a regenerative system. We've been raised as consumers within a capitalist colonialist system. So it's kind of hard for us to even verbalize um, what's needed, but actually design should be being led by farmers. You know, it, it sounds bizarre to kind of make that connection perhaps, but 90% of our ancestors only produced clothing from what was av available in their region. You know, so this is, it's not um, a ridiculous concept. It's absolutely what we need to get back to in order to be regenerative. So part of... Um, the, the work I've been doing since I founded this, I kind of threw myself in straight away to a collaboration with Laurie, Super Slow Way and the Textile Biennial and Patrick Grant of Community Clothing. We've got a really dynamic combination um, working on the Homegrown Homespun project. So um, you see the banner there. We are very much collaborating in the local community. So whereby Fibre Shed advocate for textile professionals you know, what's exciting about the collaboration with Super Slow Way is that we are working on disused urban land and accessing a community who've been really disadvantaged by the offshoring of the textile industry. So we have volunteers working with us. You're flicking through those photos fast. I can feel myself <laughs> gabbling and try and keep up. Um, but basically what we did last year, we went from seed to cloth in six months and actually from harvest day to the biennial in six weeks. <laughs> I've got grey hairs as a result of it. <laughs> but we are making a statement about actually how difficult it is to be sustainable and ethical 
if you're producing clothing in this country. Why is that? Why have we? What's the agenda behind disempowering people from the skills of self-sufficiency that all our ancestors had to a point where we are reduced and de-skilled to just be passive consumers? So we're really engaged in the community in, and um, in the heritage textile crafts. We had to do everything by hand. You know, I, I founded Fibershed because I wanted to mend my jeans with locally sourced thread. There's no such thing. There's no cellulose crops grown in this country. This is our heritage. And of course, that's so ironic because Fibershed Northwest, you actually, you stretch right across to West Yorkshire, right? So yes. you have basically got the centre of the world yeah, of exactly. cotton, wool, dye. I mean, in Bradford, they've got the, the, the International Society of Dyers there. They own the patent for every dye in the world. I mean, it, this is where it all happened originally. But it's all it's synthetic so dyes. So, yeah. you know, what the, what the issue in my fibre shed is we've got brilliant wool producers, you know, brilliant weavers like Laura's Loom, for example, look her up. She was doing fibre shed before fibre shed. She sources local wool and then her only option, because she needs cone dyeing for the quantity she has, she needs a commercial facility, is to douse it in petrochemical, yeah. basically plastic colour. So that was what I was hoping to address. Part of this project actually hopes to help upscale natural dyeing in this region so that it opens up opportunities. And to bring those communities back to our yeah. heritage. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. So on the, the picture you see there, that's... The biennial, last day the biennial, and me, Laurie, and Patrick holding this piece of cloth that had kind of shrunk from our original ideas. And what's really <laughs> great about this is a revert back to this ground up. We absolutely honoured the process. We were led by nature, the materials available and the skills available. So there are very few hand spinners who specialise in linen in this country. You know, they had certain time scales. We were bound by the weather and when we could harvest. And the, it was great that we had this opportunity to highlight it at the biennial. So we ended up with this actually beautiful piece of cloth, but not the full pair of jeans. And I'm quite glad because it would have been a bit, you know, click your fingers and we want jeans. We want them now. I want slow fashion and I want it right away, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of a good lesson to learn to let nature take the lead. Absolutely. I love that phrase that you use in your stuff. You talk about from soil to skin and... You know, yeah. that, that, that's so great, connecting us, because that's one of our problems that I'm sure we will talk about is that the disconnect. Yeah, that yeah. We'll, have well, to soil to skin to soil, to back to soil back again. To that's soil. the kind of fibre shed yeah. circularity. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Justine. Thank you. So before we start the, the conversation overall as well, can I go to Angie Young? Angie works in education, but you also do your own work. You can tell us, uh, Angie, about your uh, work on the Convert project. So Convert um, began and it was working around research that I was doing for um, a new programme at Blackpool, which is Fashion and Costume with Sustainable Practice. Wow, that was really um, some journey to sort of try. You were able to move your mic much closer, just to warn you, you need to keep these mics really, really close, that? right up like that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a journey. Um, and through that research I realized that what you were talking about just now is so difficult for students and if you are to actually bound bind students by sustainability um, rules throughout their entire process of production in fashion then you will paralyze them there will be no room for innovation or, or you know true design so I had a little bit of time um, and I um, investigated some of my own work, which is something as, as a lecturer or programme leader, you don't, you don't get much time to do that. So um, I started a project called Convert. It's still at the beginning stages. Um, and I worked with materials that all came from charity shops or throwaways. I hate waste. I've always hated waste and I've always loved materials. Um, I can't understand why people would throw away something that's still beautiful. Um, I can understand that they can fall out of love with it as a garment. But if you look at the material, there's still life and there's still love in that, in that material. So I worked with recycled materials to make a fashion collection um, and I made quite a few pieces. The pink piece that you can see there is made out of five cashmere jumpers. Um, joined together. I tried to innovate in terms of the methods that I used. Um, rather than create seams, I was trying to join the fabrics so that they were flat. Um, so that was a bit of an experimental 
um, stage for me. And once I kind of um, found my way with that, it, it was quite easy to move along um, and also buy lots of garments. So I do have a huge range of garments. And one of the things that I think that I find mostly in this area is there's such a disconnect. Students often will work with themes of sustainability. It's so exciting for them. They really like to be a sustainable student or a sustainable designer. But when it comes to their own practical life, they make unsustainable choices. It's like there is a disconnect between actually thinking, learning and doing. Some of that is because of financial restrictions um, and they, they can't afford to buy the goods that we're offering that, that fit into this world. And it's a little bit like in the round table, the first round table, when we were talking about these very high priced products, it's, it's linked to class in a way. Um, you know, people can afford to, to buy them when they're at a certain stage in their life. But if you ask a student to shop sustainably, they don't have the means to actually pay the prices. If you look at, I looked at Bethany Williams this morning on the train, um, one of her jackets was on Brown's website for 1700 pounds. Now, I'm sure every student would love to own that jacket, but they can't afford to pay that. So it, it comes from different angles. I think the work that I do is about skill. It's about traditional skills. And for me, I know we talked about the design process this morning, but for me, design is intrinsically linked to technique, technical know-how and skill. I can't design working with these types of materials without chopping them and, and putting them together and knowing how to make. So the design process is led by the making process and we don't teach our children how to make anymore. A few years ago, I was the arts advisor for the county, uh, the Girl Guide Association, which was a lot of fun, I have to say. Uh, I was the most popular person ever because I was making things with them every day. We'd go on international camps and they would always run to me saying, what are we making today, Ange, what are we making today? Because they were excited about actually getting their hands on materials and making things and they were productive and they were creative and they were inspirational. Um, and children are, but we don't allow them the opportunity. So for me, it goes right back to basics and that we should be, obviously it's not in the curriculum, but there should be other ways that we introduce it to children through you know, primary schools, through workshops, through visiting you know, uh, practitioners and artists. We should be teaching children to make and enjoy that process of making. Um, as a means to innovation uh, and life choices. Um, so Convert is a project that I'm hoping is going to develop further. Um, and I obviously will be looking for collaboration. Brilliant, thank you so much, Andrew, thank you. Um, what a great three great case studies to get us going in the conversation. I'm gonna try and bring you in as well while we kind of go along. So, so get ready to take part. Pammy, can I get you to now kind of kick off the general discussion if that's all right? Because obviously, you know, you did a lot of, of work and research around women's wear and, and, and just following on from what Andrew was saying there. Talk to us about what you think genuinely the potential for circular design within fashion and textiles is beyond the kind of projects that we've heard about so far. So it's a big question. Are you able, now just to warn you, basically you need to eat your microphones, everyone on this panel. So if you can see how close I am to mine, that's how close you I, need to be, if that's okay. I think okay. this is as close as I can Way be. close, way <laughs> closer, right. Come on, stick it right in your face, basically. <laughs> Don't be scared of the mic, go okay. on, yeah. Move it closer. Um, it's not gonna move any closer, but I can, I can move closer to there the microphone. Go. So, um, okay, so, um, from, from my perspective, in terms of fashion design and um, certainly from the industry perspective, circular economy is a really, really difficult uh, thing to achieve. Um, there is an awful lot of research taking place in, in the technical area, trying to um, identify new ways of developing uh, recycling techniques, um, bringing fabrics, you know, used fabrics or over overproduced fabrics, re re um, making new uses for for them. Um, polyester, you can get recycled polyester, and we've all 
you know, anyone that's interested in circular economy and fashion kind of knows that 1% is actually recycled and, and actually used. Um, so how, how, do we, how do we create the market for um, things that are not being used in fashion? And I think that's really quite a fundamental question that from the fashion perspective, uh, and textiles perspective, that's that's the area that I think is really um, a fundamental one to to, to consider and, and to think about. How do we engage consumers into actually not just simply um, using um, uh, secondhand clothing as as oh I, I I have this as a you know it's my sustainable thing it 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 becomes the norm. Or uh, when you know Rosie talked about the value in terms of repairing and and valuing what we have already and and cherishing it, again, how do we how do we encourage? Have you got some the... ideas about how we do that? Because it feels to me that one of the things I think is really positive about the whole debate on the fashion industry. I mean, I do, I do a lot of work on this. You know that generally a lot of questions around the climate crisis come down to whole system change, right? That actually individual actions are important, but in terms of finding the real solutions, we are talking about mass global whole system change. But fashion to me feels like one area where actually individual decisions can really make a difference. So is it things like Love Island wearing secondhand clothes or... Am I being naive and thinking the choice, you know, I'm wearing a, a dress fiver from a charity shop today. Can that make the difference? I, can I, projects like these make the difference? I think they, they can certainly highlight the, the, um, the issues. But when you think about the fashion industry, it's not just what we wear here. It's not what we buy here. It's where the, the global supply chain is. Mm -hmm. um, so if we stop, uh, and again, this is this is something that I... I, I don't have an answer to, but it is something that I think really needs a lot of thinking about. If we, you know, we, we say that actually the, 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 the quickest and easiest way to uh, um, reach or, or address circular economy is to simply buy less or make less, and yes, that's true, but then that has a real social impact on 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 that global supply chain you know the the manufacturers and and they are many thousands of miles away from us but they're still part of this this system have you got any what what should, what should we do about that sorry i'm i'm kind of throwing the entire problems of the world at your feet now um <laughs> give us the answer in 30 seconds i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but i do think we, we just need to be more aware of of that and perhaps involve the, the, the manufacturers or the makers mm. in terms of, and there, there are policies being developed by government, you know, we've got the, the, the extended producer responsibility, the EPR, that's coming through, that's going to, um, and they are actively thinking about the, 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 the implications on that whole um, supply chain. Um, but trying to, you know, involving makers and manufacturers from, the whole supply chain, how do we actually achieve circularity across that supply chain? And especially where people are reliant on that for work, for exactly. their jobs. Let, let me bring that sort of back to yourselves over here, if that's all right. I don't know which one of you might sort of want to comment on that, because the, that does lead, you know, this is such a globalised industry that that yeah. tension between let's focus on the local, let's go back to the local, let's do what we can do with things that are in the northwest what the impact on that particularly in economies where they're quite reliant mm, totally i mean uh, you know we we here uh, in east lancashire have been um caught trapped in a historical circular economy you know for as long as we could you know we we could say we in 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 modern times i.e. going back to around 1700 when the tipping point came with mechanization here you know we have great pioneers and innovators you know we can reel them off can't we you know the james hargreaves of of this world um that that put this place on the map and actually grew it you know all these towns blackburn accrington nelson were the fastest growing towns in the uk in 1900 um so populations flocked here 
uh, and then later in the in the 20th century populations from the South Asian sub in, in Indian subcontinent um, flocked here. Uh, and and really that go that that that's a, a fast fashion story that's been going on since 1700. You know when the East India Company colonised um, the the subcontinent and and basically stole all the, those skills, those ideas, and the, and those materials and brought them here. And that, I mean I could go on. I could bore you to tears well, about about that, that history now, but it, where it takes us now longer. where it takes us now we're still wrapped in that circular economy so the grandchildren and children of those mill workers for instance are working at boohoo in burnley one of the biggest uh, employers in burnley mm. and they are there to distribute the garments that are now made back in Asia, I mean, sub yeah. you know, Indian subcontinent, Vietnam, you, 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 you name it. And so it goes on, you know, you think, where is this, you know, uh, kind of ping ponging of exploitation gonna end? And, you know, somebody's already mentioned- So does that have to end in projects like the sort of thing you're doing together? I, that... Well, yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got funding now from the Climate Action Fund. Um, for for our flax grown project, homegrown homespun, because that's you know the the national lottery have have uh, devised that fund to where, raise awareness of these issues in these places, in these communities that have been you know at the uh, at the receiving end of this circular economy. So it, you know that. It, 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 economy is circular. You know, what we want, obviously, is a virtuous circle, not a vicious circle. Yeah. And that brings yeah. us back to the disconnect that you talked about, I think, quite a lot, Angie. And it's interesting that you mentioned the Boohoo stuff, because I know there's a lot of debate going on about returns at the moment and the impact that returns through online shopping in the fashion industry have have on waste and 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 i think that's really fascinating you're talking about who's working in that and where the clothes are coming from how, how do we adam let me let me ask this as well to uh, to yourself and also to christina how, how do we, what else can we do to challenge that disconnect well um i think nobody none of the children know where the clothes are made for a start so they don't understand that process so if if you actually taught it in schools from that from a young age um, how the manufacturing process works and how the global supply chain works that would make a difference they are the the the, the future consumers and we have to start young i think now because it's gone past just educating teenagers or um, university students as we talked about before but also i think we need to sort of gently politicize clothing we need to make it appear to have a message that's really important. And um, we know from the research that young people are more likely to be taking up the banner of sustainability. They, they've got the more, um, they, they've, got, they've got more power, more protest in them, but they're not the ones that have got the spending power or the power to change it. So um, there is this disconnect between those two things that, w that we need to address. Christina, have you got ideas on this? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> About that disconnect. Do, do you think, you know, do you think things like Love Island or things like the, the I mean, it's, is it Sarah that's done the, done the decision yeah, to, to stop returns? And H&M, are, are they to yeah, challenge I think it can heavily influence, can't it? Yeah. Younger, obviously educating myself, younger students. Yeah. Um, by advertising mm. those parts, definitely. What about the power of social media? Can that be, can we use the same methods that have been used to kind of push fast fashion to actually change the views I on think it? So. Yeah, fashion. yeah, like it is very powerful. Yeah, you're yeah. not in there, you yeah, reckon? We do most of that. Eat your mic. <laughs> do, do a lot of social media for, for Upso and yeah, it's a great way of getting the message across. And and the best responses we get are usually when we show people how we make it rather than just product okay. shots. They absolutely love that. Like your video. Yeah. Is yeah. it only when you get the actual materials in people's hands that they understand the value of them and you know, hopefully you can speak a little bit about, about where they came from. So, you know, if any of you ever hand spun, 
if you've ever experienced that, you know how long and how much skill that takes. My God, that is precious yarn, and you are not going to throw that away. So you've added your love and skill and attention to something that then you know, becomes more valuable to you. And we're working um, in the primary school just in higher Audley. Um, and I went, we were growing a flax field with them, but I went along and we took the flax break and some simple drop spindles and a little mini weaving loom. And I just showed them, you know, the process of hand spinning and made that connection between this, um, you know, piece of straw flax to this weaving. And it's not something we're taught and it's only when you actually try it you understand the skill involved. And then, yeah, like I say, you value everything more then. I mean, it, you know, it, it's ridiculous. Um, uh, last year when we, when we made, when we did our, grew our first field and, and harvested our first harvest, that how miraculous it felt and how excited we all were. I mean, really pathetic. <laughs> You know, we like sowed these seeds in a, a field that had been a fly tipping, a, a disused space of fly tipping by the canal um, uh, that, you know, look, was a real blight in that community, actually. And we just got a growing army of volunteers who cleared the field and sowed the seeds. And then, you know, in April last year, I, you know, I've done mega projects in my life. But I don't think I've ever been as nervous, you know, thinking, is it going to rain? Yeah. Can we have some sun? Oh, my God. And then when the first little one of our uh, volunteers, Aisha, who's on, uh, uh, been on the slides, who lives there, like, took a photograph and said, oh, my God, it's growing as a shoot. <laughs> and we were, honestly, we were jumping up and down, clapping in the office. You. It connects you to nature. Like, we started looking, caring about the weather. I mean, those plants need water, those plants need sun. So immediately, there's this process we're undertaking is altering our behaviour. And well, but, but, so but, all, but also the miracle of this b actually beautiful plant that grows. It flowers in, in June, beautiful, really beautiful blue flower uh so it looks incredibly picturesque you know it looks like a bloody pastoral idyll in Aya Audley and um and then it, and then when it the seed heads are these beautiful golden orbs and um you know when we harvested them and then you know you break this very tough uh straw and you release these beautiful silken yarns you know, it's like, whoa. And, you know, for some, you know, somebody hardened long in the tooth like me, actually, it was just really moving. And I thought, my God, this is just a real, real symptom of how disconnected yeah. we are. Yeah. Tom, let me bring you in on this, because obviously, I mean, you were talking earlier about, about the role of the lab and everything. And it feels to me that that one part of the disconnect is exactly that thing Justine was saying there about being for us being able to make and having the spaces to go and make and the equipment to enable us to use what we've got. Yeah, definitely. And um, it's one sort of it's a bit of an oversight of, of the maker rooms that we that we don't have any equipment um, for the community to use, and it's something that we're trying to to address certainly now. But I, but I agree that if a, a young person has to go through the the love or the pain of making their own clothes, whether it's a good experience or a bad experience, they will remember it and they'll sort of value a uh, piece of clothing. Do you know what? I, I mean, there's, there's a few of you a similar age to me. I'm not going to point out who I think looking. But you see, I remember dyeing old sheets in an old quality street tin on the stove. You know, you used to get those little things of dye long dye, right? Yeah. And you'd punch them. Do you remember? And you'd punch them and you'd stick them in with an old wooden spoon and boil it up on the stove. And I've still got pictures of me aged a 15-year-old goth, right, out in Leeds, going to uh, the warehouse and the phone on basic places, made it, in, wearing these were basically old sheets wrapped around me that I'd been dyed different colours on the stove. I mean, and, and that was just such a great thing. I mean, they were terrible clothes, but it was such a great thing to be able to do, exactly that feeling, because I, like, I made this. Yeah, and I don't, even if it's sort of objectively terrible, uh, to, to a young person who enjoyed the process and is proud of what they've done, um, it, it's not terrible to them as well, so they can, they can have more pride in the clothes that they wear. It does change you. You know, before you've done whatever you're specialising in there, you know, or say we're doing spinning, once you've done spinning, you're a spinner. 
Yeah. So you're empowered by those skills. And it, it, Absolutely. You, know. you, look, you look at sort of everything as like, how was that made? How was that injection molded? Mm. How was that made kind of thing? Um, you you can't turn up. We, like we don't. We don't. So that's, that's what ah, we're saying. It's, there you go. That's I know. an idea it's, it, Well, it's, it's, a, it's something. machines? None of it. We So it's a big oversight and we have applied for funding and we've not been <laughs> successful yet. Um, but it is, it is all the part. Have you got a library of things where you're loaning them out to people as well? Uh, not so much. I mean, people can come to the making rooms for free on Saturdays, um, mm. 10 till 6, um, and, and use the machines and, and our um, so trainers how many, completely free. concept have you got in this, in this part of the world where you've got libraries of things like sewing machines and knitting machines and spinners? And... No, none. And um, we've talked a lot at, with the British Textile Biennial about getting... Um, uh, a place where the, you, you can go to to sew with, with you know, a, a, a few rows of sewing machine uh, and people can uh, learn fr fr from e each other. But I think um, one one thing I, I noted that somebody mentioned maybe about scaling up these things, mm -hmm. you know, and going back to this morning's discussion about craft skills, you know, like, like Justine said earlier, that those skills have become the preserve of the middle classes now as craft hobbies. Um, and again, you know, I should talk about middle class old women, you know, I do should talk about pop calling kettle black but i don't so um and and uh, you know it's become that hobbyist preserve um which is really dangerous because it amplifies that that so that disconnect let me look at this end of the table um, i've just started in the last year to develop um an adult art school at, at blackpool um which it sounds like that's probably not a new thing, and it isn't a new thing, because we used to have a really vibrant adult uh, section uh, up till a few years ago. So we decided we'd try and bring it back, and that's been really super successful in the last year. We've, we've quadrupled our, our target for, for numbers. Uh, and like you say, they are predominantly retired, older people that come to the class. They make women. amazing things. Women. Predominantly. Not yes, they're predominantly women, but I, I have one young man who um, has remade his grandpa's dinner jacket into mm. an amazing waistcoat. He has a business degree and decided to come and do that in the class. But the point that I'm trying to make there is I actually bring in my degree students to work alongside them. So they, they come in and they work with the part-time students. And that's been such a really nice um kind of interaction mm -hmm. um they, they they pass their sort of um more advanced skills onto mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah. older I, I do. onto the older yeah, yeah. students and the older students interact by helping them by bringing them materials one of them gave them a knitting machine um and giving them advice and helping them when they're coming up to deadlines um it's it's been really super and i and i've really enjoyed that really yeah, enjoyed yeah. watching how the generations can work together so is that david let then uh, come to you know because we're obviously uh, uh, um, a lot of women on the panel but um uh, coming to you then is that the answer do we need generational stuff and do we need more tom Daly's and george clooney because george clooney's come out that he loves sewing doesn't he and that he sews in his spare time and obviously tom Daly it seems to be the greatest knitter in britain at the moment <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I think you've got some role models there that can uh, get the message across that it's 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 great to create and uh, and have fun doing it. I think that, that that's, that's good and can breed a new generation of, of creators. Um, so yeah, it's a good thing. Pammy, you, what are you thinking on this one? What what else can we do to scale up, particularly? I think um, you know we've got the um, the examples here, uh, which I think are great, but we really need to be. Um, promoting uh, things like repairing and sewing as, as life skills mm -hmm. that you know th these are fundamental things that people need to you know live a quality of life uh, the number of times people don't wear things because they can't put the button back on or they the, the hems kind of frayed yeah um, and they just don't know what to do with it, with a garment that they actually do like but they don't feel that yeah. they can wear because a very simple thing is, has gone wrong yeah. um, and so not being able to do that 
it's 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 kind of like the the equivalent of not being able to change the light bulb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, two two things are coming to mind. Two interviews I've done recently, things I've chat. Yesterday, I sat through a a, a talk uh, by Matthew. <laughs> Uh, the leader of Preston Council talking about community wealth building and what they've done in Preston, which is re really, really astonishing. And uh, there they were, they were talking about the spaces that they're making available. And then last week, I was also out reporting with uh, a load of knitters who had knitted um, loads of stuff to for their for the jubilee to transform their town centre now they, they mainly were kind of older women not all of them but what was really interesting was some of the younger women who got involved had, had said they'd been live that this knitting group was a lifesaver for them not necessarily because of the knitting but because of the group and i think there's something there about the whole social aspect and mm -hmm. bringing Perfect. people together and that's very much what you've done about yeah. ways to to change people's habits by actually creating community it's a bizarre our, um, state of affairs when you're kind of demeaning predominantly fem female crafts and you can only kind of do that and devalue these textile crafts when you're exploiting labor for, in other countries um, so you know hooray for the middle-aged crafty women because the entire fiber shed organization is built <laughs> on us and yeah we are using our privilege to to, to try and work out these issues um, but these skills are so needed now because they bridge the gap between farming and fashion. We have to bring fashion down to earth. You can only, you should only be working within your um, ecological resource base and skills base. So yeah, that's and and I think there's something interesting uh, about the point that Uthra raised uh, as well uh, about the um, what did you call it? The global majority um, and our diasporic communities. Um, who you know generation below this uh definitely brought very you know high skills um with them and kind of have almost forbid their children to to inherit those and uh, you know I just think there's something uh both fascinating and scary uh about the 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 whole layers of uh, of disconnect just going on to scaling up, which is something we are now really grappling with, with homegrown, homespun, um, because as uh, as Justine described, last year when we harvested the flax, we just wanted to uh, create, try and create a piece of fabric. So the harvest is, har is harvested in late August, and we wanted to show a piece of fabric in October when the British Textile Biennial was on. So we could only do a bit you know, uh, we could only process a bit and actually hand spin a bit because of the time it takes and then weave it, which was actually much more difficult than any of us has anticipated. We did it live downstairs here, but that left us with 200 kilos of flax left from last year's harvest. And we now have three fields. So we're going to have, you know, going on for a thousand kilos of flax uh, this year. And we really want to be able to spin it, weave it, to a oh, quality because yeah, the last thing you want to do is to to lose it oh no we won't lose it but to how we how we do it how we spin it and weave it to a quality of fabric that then patrick grant um can create a homegrown homespun collection to launch at, at next year's textile biennial and that's a really thorny issue that di we're dealing with at the moment because you know, ironically, the linen wet spinning process was invented in Blackburn, yeah. Yeah. in Blackburn. Yeah. And yet, why aren't we the linen capital of the world? Why is Ireland seen as, uh, as the linen capital of the world? Because uh, the government here wouldn't patent it. So he had to go, to, he took it to Ireland to patent it. This has left us with the, the position that we cannot find anywhere in the UK, actually including Ireland, that can spin that 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 quantity well, that of flax. Skill, so we have to it? take it to France yeah. this year to get it spun and then bring it back here. We can get get it woven in Burnley. So yeah, absolutely. In terms Tom, of the spinning, bring in if anybody in the audience wants to get ready. So. In terms of the spinning, is that a machine or a skills it, uh, it, it, failure? Here? Uh, well, it, I mean, it's mainly the the, the machines because you can you can learn how yeah. to use the machines, but it's the it's the machines on that scale, and it's wet spinning produces that fine yarn. Yeah. As you say, the irony that 
Yeah, but it was invented here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Because the, the one thing I just keep thinking when we have these conversations about the North, do you know what? We have to take our responsibility in the North for the climate crisis because we were the home and the start of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think Northerners can take that responsibility because yeah, it was basically... A history that yeah. we should be able to build on. No, absolutely. The future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Patrick always uses the analogy of the Isle of Harris, making Harris tw tweed, where almost every single member of that community that lived there are somehow involved in the process of creating... Uh, the fabric and and indeed the what well, the, the some you know the the objects that the the fabric is made and that's you know he asks why can't we do it here why can't we do it in Blackburn where we can we can make uh, we can be famous again for creating really high quality linen garments that every single member of the community from a five year old to a hundred year old can be involved in yeah and why not brilliant let's. Uh... Some Hello. Hello. Um, I just wanted to make an observation, really, from something I heard uh, a couple of days ago at an event I was at with one of our um, partner projects and uh, in Blackpool called Left Coast. And they've just started a brilliant initiative, uh, a community laundrette. And one of the reasons they've started this community laundrette is because of a story that was told to them from somebody living on one of the estates in Blackpool, which was that they were... This person was buying T-shirts from Asda, 90p, and letting their kids wear those T-shirts until they were so dirty that they couldn't wear them anymore, throwing them away because they couldn't afford to wash the clothes. They couldn't afford to pay for a washing machine. They can't afford the electricity to pay to wash the clothes, let alone a tumble dryer or put your heating on to dry the clothes. Um, and I think, you know, those kinds of problems are also the problems that we need to solve mm. in order to be able to reduce the kind of waste. Because if you're hearing that, and it prompted me, because I then had heard, heard a similar story, even at my kids' school, which isn't in an area where you would imagine that that is a problem necessarily. And people buying school uniform, wearing it for a half term, chucking it away, buying again. That's cheaper than cleaning your kids, you know, cleaning your clothes. And I think those those kind of fundamental mm. life issues, you know, the choices, these are these are privileged choices, aren't they, mm -hmm. that, that some people get to make. And we can't forget that in the narrative, because if we do, it becomes such a polarizing issue, I think, in yeah. society mm. that it 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 makes for such a problematic conversation. So if we can fix that, like more community laundrettes as well as more making spaces and more more teaching people to repair and reuse things. Um, so. Thank you. I'm going to get some more comments from them. We'll, we'll kind of come back and respond to lots of things. So you had your hand up, yeah? Uh, yeah, it's just mainly uh, two points, one good uh, and one maybe a little bit bad. Uh, going back to Boohoo, uh, and a, a secondary concern of mine is the access to finance that makes it so easy uh, these days. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's perhaps one of the you know, unique advantages where within a click of a button, you've got a Klarna account uh -huh. and, and you're paying the item off on drip for uh -huh. a number of months and it may end up costing you twice as much. Uh, so I think that's a real danger uh, that maybe needs some government intervention uh, on that. Uh, the second point uh, is, you know, places like Boohoo have had that competitive advantage uh, for a number of years now, uh, but I personally think that's been eroded. Uh, I think the access to technology and e-commerce and a global audience is certainly a lot easier to achieve. I've personally been involved with a Lancashire-based startup uh, for years that started from zero and now sells in excess of a thousand pairs of Lancashire-made shoes a month. Uh, so using that technology that saw them have mm. that advantage has then kind of been eroded, whereas anyone for a small kind of subscri subscription, you can have access to a, a responsive website, you can have a global reach with the videos that you produce. Mm. You can use the same Instagram influencers to tag the products. And when they activate that campaign, you can sell your own products. So those advantages aren't there anymore. And I think it's very exciting times for people to, to kind of take that step. If you've got a product or a concept, you can achieve rapid results yourself. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to some more Somebody comments. There with a yeah. And then, oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm not particularly uh, a fashion person. I studied games design, 
and I'm not really very good at this sort of fashion thing. But I've been thinking, what just while you've been discussing, about how to reuse clothes and that sort of thing. Now, um, I think a lot of people my age don't actually have that much money. But they do have a lot of old clothes, especially if they're young enough, clothes they've grown out of. So instead of throwing away, the idea is right to reuse them. But you don't know how, right? So I reckon, as an idea, to promote among people my age or maybe a bit older that have these backlog of clothes that don't want to throw them away, you say, all right then, come here into a room and we will teach you for either a low price or if you can for free, but that's not necessarily possible. And rather than teaching it as a sort of more sustainable thing, do it as a uh, mature thing, saying you're becoming more self-sufficient by doing this. Because a lot of people as well, after they've studied university, they want to feel like an adult rather than <laughs> just like a little boy or girl, you know, messing around, you know. So I think uh, like pitching it as a opportunity to grow up and to really take advantage of exciting, you know, make your own clothes. And it is it's a good thing. So my, you can't see my pockets. I'm not going to show them. It's a bit embarrassing. They split. And so I have to figure out how to sew my old underpants to make pockets again. They ripped. It's not good. But... Staple them. I'll do it in September and I'll let you know how it goes. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very brilliant. much. Excellent. This is idea brilliant. creation in reality, in action. As One more question it. here. So rather than some a question, I think I've got something to say. Um, you were talking earlier about having libraries of sewing machines so people could use them. So I was thinking, why not use a library? To have a library of sewing machines yeah, that goes with idea. the local history of the textile industry mm -hmm. um, and you can start going and reading about how to make things having a library of sewing machines that you can go and use and get some of the older people in the community to show people how to use brilliant them. well you've got the best library on your doorstep you can start right there in accrington absolutely yeah. and there's big spaces in that library that aren't being used yeah and that that library isn't well used no you know when i go in it it's virtually empty mm. but to me growing up that's and the it, place yeah, i went to exactly i mean it's that beautiful classic carnegie library that's a university on every corner um model and that's what and it's there for the empowerment of the community isn't it yeah it's a brilliant idea especially with you know this sewing bee patrick's work raising awareness of um, making your own clothes it's like very timely isn't it so mm. yeah Brilliant. Thank you all for those contributions. We've just got a couple of minutes left of this session. Um, loads of issues there. Real questions about money and finance and access to things and, and who can afford what. Questions there about intergenerational stuff, learning from each other. Questions there about how we can motivate ourselves um, and, and give people excitement by being able to do things uh, themselves. And, I, and specific ideas around libraries. Who would like to just very quickly kind of, let, let me give you your last say, if you like, around this table. Uh, cool. So um, on, in terms of libraries, I think it's a great place to have makerspaces. There was central government funding back in, I think, 2015 to start makerspaces in libraries. It doesn't exist anymore, but I think it's something that definitely should do. Um, I really like the idea of a, a community laundrette. We're starting a project with Lancaster University on the right to repair and starting a repair shop. So that'd be a great opportunity to get broken washing machines, get the community repairing them, and then use that as a as a resource as well. So that's that's my bit. Brilliant. Anyone else want to uh, join us? I think there are offshoots like this all around the the northwest. I think if if we actually sort of did a big sort of question reach out we would all know of things that are happening that are good things but there isn't any way of actually sort of linking all that together I don't think I mean we do have a repair shop in Blackpool that I know of that some of my students have been to work on I've been to Fab Lab and, and I've been to other places like that in London when I was doing research and they're, they're great spaces the other thing leading on from um, this morning's conversation in London, we, when I worked with my daughter on a, a fashion brand uh, for five years, which was an amazing experience, actually. We didn't make any money, but we had a, an amazing time. We showed at Fashion Week and we showed at New York. Um, but we, we were lucky enough to get a brand new studio um, that was part of a development of new flats and apartments. And the council actually stipulated in the local area that if you're building new bills, you have to actually provide artist studios on the ground floor. 
uh, and because we were a startup, we got that for half price for two years. So it, it does help if you've got uh, backing from local councils. Um, you know, we can talk a lot about regenerating spaces, but actually there are lots of empty spaces that could be given over to this sort of thing. And also new spaces could include um, workspaces for artists and craftspeople. I do think there is Thank a- Thank you. A, a, Thank you. Anybody else like to uh, just kind of some final words? Hi, sorry. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention, I um, wouldn't necessarily class myself as middle class or an older lady, hopefully not, maybe to young people. Um, I have a five and two year old. Um, and you're talking about clothing. Um, I think it's more about education. I don't have time to sew just because of my job. And again, five and a two year old. However, what we specifically do with them is we buy ethical, ethically made clothing we buy pre-loved clothing um, and there are also options now to rent children's clothing and you change that as they go up by size and i think the difference is is that that isn't widely known so these sort of uh, issues aren't spoken about with younger people and they're not spoken about when say you're having your first baby or they're not spoken about like again we use cloth nappies which is people are like what but it's, again, it's a sustainable way. I use those on both of my children. I've lent them out to friends. You know, they will then get passed on to other friends. And I think it's more about education. Yes, we need the spaces. I am a creative. We need spaces for children to learn, but we also need to educate people on how to fit that into their lives, but also on, on ways to do that rather than just being like, yes, we need these creative spaces, don't get me wrong, but we need other alternatives for people who aren't, feeling the creative or don't have the time and they need to understand how they can do that does that sort of make sense no that makes but i just sense. wanted to sort of put that in there as sort of like a weird parent of small children great <laughs> thank you thank you very much very quickly any last comments no oh that's right okay brilliant we, we're just just coming up to the end i mean i think that's a great place to finish actually a really really good place to finish because it feels to me some of the themes coming through are about this whole question about kind of system change, society's change, the need for political support for making some of these things happen and th some of these things happen at local level, at bigger level. I mean, it, you know, uh, it, it's really, really interesting about what, what you can do in terms of building on what there already is locally, building on that local history when politically there is much more support for um, viewing that within economic policies, for example, not seeing circular economy as something that kind of sits over there as something nice, but actually seeing it as part of economic discussions, part of the discussions about how we structure everything. Um, there's so much going on, there's clearly so much going on in the Northwest. Uh, if, if we can bring that together and discussions like this are absolutely a part of it. I mean, one of the things I just think is brilliant about creatives is that creatives I just think um, have the key for how we can build the story. I know in the first in the first session we talked a lot about storytelling. Creatives often are the way that we can build that story and get more people thinking about it. That there's such a role there for creativity in helping us do that and in helping us do it not just about creativity but about the sort of things you've just been talking about there about how do we change the mindset creatives are definitely uh, right at the forefront of us being able to do that so i think that brings us nicely to you and thank you very much to our brilliant what brilliant panel they were thank you and thank you all to you as well for your fab fab comments uh, and fab interactions um, i'm not quite sure what happens next so i'll hand over hello oh. Um, I've just got to say thank you to everybody again. So thank you to all of you for joining us, all our previous panel. Thank you so much. Thank you particularly to the Crafts Council as a partner on this event and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as well. Um, it's brilliant to have the Crafts Council come and interact with us um, up here um, as part of Festival of Making. And it's brilliant because it's Rosie's last year at the Crafts Council. So we're really pleased to have her with us in this final part of her journey with the Crafts Council. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to encourage you all to come and spend some time at the Festival of Making as well, because it is honestly one of the most wonderful, joyous um, celebrations of making and all that history and heritage that we have in this area of making.
And I think, you know, we've missed it over the last couple of years that we haven't been able to have that conversation about how important making is to us and our lives here in Lancashire. So please, please do try and hang out and spend some time um, making something, you know, getting back, getting into those materials and having fun. But on behalf of Creative Lancashire, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of you, to everybody that's organised it, to the people who are filming it um, and all the panellists. Thank you very, very much. And we'll see you all making something over the next couple of days hopefully thank you